Chapter 3, Media. So previously we looked at the components and the composition of the work, how it is composed. Uh, now we're going to look at the materials and techniques used to make art. This piece by Nam June Paik um, is made up of some really interesting alternative, alternative uh, media and alternative materials. It's a map of the United States. Uh, it's called Electronic Superhighway, Continental U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, 1995. Um, and it's a 49-channel it's a, uh, closed-circuit video installation. So video installations can be a lot of things. They can be a projection on a wall. Um, in his particular case, what he liked to do is multiple television screens quite often, or one television screen with some other things around it. Very famous artist, huge artist. And actually, a friend of mine uh, helps to work on a lot of this technology, which is now old technology. At the time, and he started these in the 70s, uh, this was, you know, cutting-edge technology. These were current televisions at the time. And he set these up as a commentary about advertising signage and television imagery, how much it's taken apart or taken over our culture in the U.S., Damien Hirst is a, another really interesting artist. Again, he started out in the 20th, late 20th century. Um, and this is actu an actual human skull, a real skull. And it's got human teeth. And then he took diamonds. And this is worth a lot of money because it has 8,601 actual real diamonds, including this very large one here. So Damien Hirst's work is edgy and complicated um, and again we wouldn't normally see this in an art uh, form we're not looking at drawing and painting we're not looking at oil painting for example we're not looking at sculpture carved out of marble we're in both cases of these two examples we're looking at found materials to a degree I mean Nam June Paik had this neon made to go around the states but the televisions were existing objects uh, the skull was an existing object from a real human, and then the diamonds were existing objects, and then they were appliqued or, um, you know, uh, set onto the, the skull. Probably drilled in and then epoxied, that would be my guess. I don't know for sure. So for Damien Hirst, for people in the late 20th century or, or past, you know, 1960s, there's a lot of, of playing with materials that are non-traditional. But what his focus is uh, was to focus on a vanitas, which means the te impermanence or of temporal life. So the idea of a human skull and it's got diamonds means basically you cannot take it with you when you go. And you've heard that expression probably. Um, this is the same sort of a, a focus on that six, from 1640. This is from 2007, pretty recent piece. So in 1640, they would do these elaborate table settings, but a lot of times there would be things like uh, jewels and pearls and um, money you would see on a vanitas. And usually there's a mirror too to point out that youth is not lasting. Okay, But this is taking a, a different media. Our focus is media expressing this traditional idea in a non-traditional way. All right, so drawing from the get-go, we go way back with drawing. We can go into 20,000 years ago and 30,000. They keep finding, you know, these cave drawings, which are amazing. Uh, this is an Egyptian drawing, so this is only probably five or 6,000 years old. It's one of the oldest disciplines, and there's so many different materials and different cultures that have evolved um, separately and then coming together and, and starting to inform one another. But this is painted limestone. But this isn't a true fresco. We'll get into frescoes later. But this is painted limestone, probably from inside a tomb. Um, and now it's in the Louvre Paris. Is just this chunk of rock that we're looking at this drawing on. Drawing is very old. Uh, it's one of the most basic things, basic acts we ever do as a human. Um, in this case, we're looking at a more recent piece from 1976. And this is colored pencil on paper, if you can believe that. It looks like a painting, um, but this has um, a lot of detail, a lot of richness in color, and this is a beautiful piece, and it's all done with colored pencil on paper, and then it's attached 
to um, uh, a backing, like an upholstery backing, and it's, it's flat, and there's a mirror, so it's sort of like you're the third person. I don't want to get too far afield because I want to stay on materials. So this particular piece is pencil on paper, super simple, 1995. So not, you know, too long ago, people are still making drawings with pencil and paper. Different materials, and we'll get into those. So charcoal is a carbon stick created from a burnt wood. You have to burn it just so. Um, sometimes if you've noticed, if you ever had a fire at home, or bonfire at the beach or camping or something there's ash that just completely disintegrates and then there's these chunks of charcoal so it has to have been just so hot and just so much air got to it to create charcoal charcoal is a pretty old um, traditional uh, material and often like I said you know we think about primitive times Somebody um, picked up a piece of charcoal from a cold fire and started to draw with it. So it's been around a long time, as long as we've been making fires. This is from 2002. Charcoal on paper and then added some color to it. Chalk and pastels. And there's also a thing called oil pastels as well. There's a newer product that's probably only about 40 or 50 years old. Chalk and pastels have been a long time and there's different uh, binders. So wax is a binder, also glue is a binder, and um, there are different types of binders. Now there's a video I loaded for you guys on pigments and binders. I suggest you watch it. It's uh, really important to understand the difference between what these things are. The pigment is always the coloring material. Now pigments can be made from uh, vegetables or or different, um, like beets, you know how beets are dark red. Um, they aren't necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily good long-lasting colorants, but <clears throat> pigments come in a range of um, sources. They come from a range of sources, such like iron oxide comes from rocks. You know, you smash certain rocks and you mix it with oil, and you get oil paint. In this case, you mix it with chalk, and then you get a chalk pastel okay so a uh, pastel drawings they are um, really beautiful and lovely but if you touched it wrong you would rub it off so it doesn't have a way to adhere to the paper very well and usually you spray it with um, a fixative and it's kinda like putting hairspray on top of it if that makes sense sometimes people even use actual hairspray um, but at any rate, pastels are very um, beautiful, but it's a dry medium, so it doesn't stick to the paper that well. Silver point, again, another dry media. Silver point is, um, it's kind of hard to describe. It's sort of like if you had a mechanical pencil, but what would be coming out of it would be silver. Um, it's mixed with some other, other materials, but basically you would draw with it on the paper, and then the air would get to it and it would um, sort of tarnish and then it would really get this beautiful quality to the drawing. So it would be kind of light and not, not invisible, I wouldn't say that, but it wouldn't be as strong. It would look kind of more like this and then over time it would look like this, a little bit darker and a richer of a drawing. The thing about silver point is you cannot erase it very well. So if you didn't know how to draw, you wouldn't be using silver point. You would really have to know what you wanted. Um, sometimes there's messy lines that are left over, uh, and artists do that all the time. Really, we don't go so crazy with the eraser. Sometimes we leave the mistakes in. So uh, the background, and I forgot to mention this, is coated with layers of gesso. The paper or the wood uh, would have to have a chemical reaction to the silver point by absorbing it into it a little bit. And you'd also put like a little bit of glue into the um, gesso. All right, wet media, I'm gonna stop there and do the second part.